Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. But 1,986 years ago, the church was born on this very day. And so we're going to celebrate today the day of Pentecost by doing a study. We're going to begin a study actually today in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that I'm going to call the Spirit and the Bride. This is the relationship between the church and the Holy Spirit. What is that relationship? What is the Holy Spirit? You know, because we don't talk about the Holy Spirit a lot, which there's a reason for that. We're going to talk about all of the issues that Paul brings up in First and in Second Corinthians. This study will probably take us well into August. I hope you don't tire of it. First uh, and Second Corinthians, very important letters to the New Testament church. And so we're going to begin here today in chapter 2 with what I think is the kickoff of Paul's discussion of the Spirit of God with the Corinthians. Uh, They had the Spirit of God, but they were not quite set on exactly what they should be knowing about the Spirit of God. So Paul kind of gives them several lessons, and we're going to look at those lessons in both books of Corinthians, the Spirit and the Bride. Book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm not going to tell you a verse because we're just going to start in verse 1. Because chapter 2, the whole thing is almost the whole thing. Almost this entire chapter is about Paul speaking to this church about the excellency of the Spirit of God. So we begin with the Spirit's first work. Notice in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now you'll notice that we have, as I said, this is the Spirit's first work. Um, And before we get exactly to that, I want you to notice the context of Paul's preaching. He says there in verse 1, I came to you not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. This is good news for anybody who preaches the gospel. I'm so glad that I don't have to have the oratory skill of Billy Graham or the charisma of Billy Sunday to preach the gospel because I would be repairing cars right now if that was the case. I don't have it. I know that this is the work of the Spirit of God that he uses adults like me to preach because I can't come with anybody with excellency of speech or wisdom. I don't have it. But I can declare the testimony of God, that which I've loved and that which I've been taught of God. I can can communicate that. And so Paul gives this context to them. He's not the greatest preacher in the world. His preaching is weak. It's not wise according to the wisdom of the world. And remember who he's talking to. He's talking to a Greek audience, the Corinthian church. So this is actually on the Greek peninsula. This is a city there. And so they know about all the great philosophers. I'm sure that they're trained in those philosophies. Their children are trained, no doubt, in Epicureanism and Stoicism and all the philosophers that have ever been. They they know them. And so Paul doesn't even try to pretend like uh, he's going to imitate them or be like them. He says, I'm not coming to you in that way. He says, I've come to you with one thing. He says, one message, one theme. It's not high and lofty. It's not get rich quick. It's not how to be a better you. It's none of that. 
It is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he quickly narrows the field of the things that he's going to talk about. This is, this is all I'm going to say. I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I'm going to know among you, the only thing. Now, you notice what he says about himself in verse 3. This is not a picture of confident living. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul was not only not a great orator, but he was also weak in appearance. You would see Paul and you would think, well, he must not be much. You know, he doesn't puff himself up. He doesn't play the part. He doesn't dress put together and he doesn't look like the man that we would expect would be behind a pulpit because we all have that image of the preacher or the orator that's confident and direct and bold and, you know, all of those things. It's a, those are lovely pictures, but that's not Paul. Paul says, I came, I was with you in weakness, fear, and in much trembling. He said he was that way because his speech and his preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That's verse 4 there. He didn't sound like other Greek orators of his day who were persuading men to their cause. He was in no way enticing, not by his appearance, not by his words, not by his skill in speaking. You notice that he says there, my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. As I have preached this gospel for the last 28, 29 years and studied preaching and watched preaching, I've noticed that there is a, there is a it's almost like a temptation for pastors to try to be like other pastors, to try to be like great orators of the past and to imitate them and to be enticing and to learn tricks to manipulate in their preaching so that they can, you know, get people to respond to the preaching. Paul was not that way. He, he didn't use those things, those methods and means. You know, he wasn't, um, he wasn't a Finley, you know, trying to figure out the method, the best method, so that men might engage with the gospel. Paul said, my preaching was not with enticing words. It wasn't a wisdom or a method devised by any man. He just came with a simple, singular message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, of course, he tells us in the chapter right before this that this is foolishness. He says there in verse 25, foolishness of God. So people were not in great droves going to come to hear him speak. But notice how this is set against the weakness of his person because he says there in verse 4, He came not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. You would look at Paul and say, well, nothing's going to happen here, but then something happened here because it wasn't Paul that was doing it. And suddenly everybody would say, aha, we know what's happening now. This is not Paul. This is not the wisdom of the world. This is not method in preaching or speaking in oratory. This is not good rhetoric. No, this is something otherworldly. This is something completely different. This is the spirit of God and power. The demonstration of power, not enticing words, is always the first work of the spirit of God among the elect. I don't know where you were when you were born again, but I know what happened to you because I know what happened to me. Suddenly the Spirit of God took the Word of God and applied it to my heart and it was like a thunderclap and my eyes opened and I realized that I was in sin and headed to a devil's hell. And it wasn't because I heard some great preacher speak. It was because the Spirit of God took His Word and applied it to this poor, corrupt heart and I was born again. And I saw myself in light of the cross, and I cried out to Jesus because of it. That's the work of the Spirit of God. Not in enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power. And that's the power that is demonstrated every time a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, comes to Jesus Christ. They have that flashpoint where suddenly they realize, that's me. And it's not because of the deliverer. It's because of the power behind the message. The Spirit of God speaks. He enlivens and quickens the heart 
creating in us a great desire to cry out for salvation and the gift of eternal life. This is the first work, and it's always the first work. That's why Paul says, my message was this, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because he knew that with that message and the power of the Spirit working in the hearts of his hearers, it didn't matter if he was weak and in fear and in much trembling. It didn't matter if he didn't preach like a, a Stoicist or an Epicurean. It didn't matter if his philosophy didn't match theirs. It didn't matter if his speaking was poor. It didn't matter if he wasn't charismatic and he didn't have boldness when he spoke. None of that mattered. None of that mattered. Because he knew with the message that he had, Jesus Christ and him crucified, and the power of God behind it, that people, the elect in his audience, were going to be saved. That's all. That's it. This is always the first work of the Spirit of God. Always. Always the first work of the Spirit of God among the elect is this kind of demonstration. That's why when you read about Jonathan Edwards reading... His sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and you read that sermon and you think about Jonathan Edwards doing this because he had poor eyesight, reading his text like this, looking down at the paper and speaking in his monotone. That when the Spirit of God fell and people were convicted and they felt like they were sliding into hell itself, you know why? It's not because of Jonathan. It's not because of his great sermon, although it is a great sermon. It's doctrinally great. But it's because he presented Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the Spirit of God worked that day through him, through that message, because of the message, and changed hearts. And that began the first great awakening. And, of course, it was really already begun, but that was the first major outbreak of it at Edwards Church. This is always the work of the Spirit of God. This is the way revival comes, always. Revival is not something that you plan and put on a calendar Revival is not a a method, it's not a means, it's always the work of the Spirit of God. And there is Pentecost that happens every time a boy or a girl, a man or a woman comes to faith in Jesus Christ because of that work that he does in us. And it's only by the Spirit of God that that work can take place. That's what Paul knew. And he says there, I don't want you to depend. He says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what a wonderful gift Paul gives these people, I'm not coming to you in my own strength, in my own wisdom, with great oratory skill. I come to you with a singular message, depending on the power of God, so that your faith won't depend on the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of men, but the power of God. And so every one of us that's born again, we will look back to that moment when we received the gospel, and we know We know what happened back there, and we know that everything that happened back there at that moment when we received Jesus was because of the Spirit of God and His power working in us. It wasn't because of anything else. I mean, thank God for the people that were there that were faithful and that were, you know, witnessing and speaking and preaching and all the rest in my life. I thank God for them. But my faith doesn't stand... In them, my faith stands in what Jesus did in me. Now, verses 6 through 8. This is the part of the chapter that I'm just going to briefly go over because he's making his argument about wisdom. He says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the prince of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained. Before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what is that hidden wisdom, that mystery that the world doesn't know? Remember what he told the Corinthians he was only going to know among them? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. That's the mystery. But it's now no longer a mystery, except to the world, because they still don't know it. But to those who are perfect, what he says there in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the church, those that know, those that have the mystery, those that have the hidden knowledge revealed. That's it. 
And it's no longer really hidden because it's being preached around the world today. It's being preached in places like Taiwan, like we read this morning, places like East Asia, places like India, the South Pacific Islands and China, even though they're being persecuted and killed in the 1040 window where, you know, where the uh, Islamists are killing Christians by the thousands. It's being preached in Africa and South America. It's being preached in the United States and in Canada. It's being preached all over the world. And so it's not hidden any longer, but for generations it was. And now here comes the preaching of the gospel. And this mystery is now being made known. It's not the wisdom of the world. And he makes that very clear. The wisdom of the world. You look over at verse chapter 1 and he, he makes very clear what the wisdom of the world is. But what is this that the Spirit of God now does in the church? He does this revealing work, this work of revelation of the Spirit of God. Notice verse 9. But as it is written, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Well, wait a minute. I thought these things were not seen, heard, or we haven't even imagined them, what God has prepared. But now the Spirit of God is revealing them? That's right. So while it was not revealed previously, it is now by the Holy Spirit what God has prepared for them that love him. And that is the work of the Spirit of God. If you are in Christ, you have been called by a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, and you have been given the revelation of the things before concealed. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit of God. The first work is... The demonstration of power, the demonstration of the Spirit and power, that is the calling that you receive, that sudden revelation that you are in need of that gospel, that you are in need of that Christ, that you are in need of forgiveness of sin, that you are in need of new life, all that. But then the second work is, in the church, the work of God in the church by the Spirit is the work of revelation. He's showing us all these things that God has prepared for them that love him. Do you love him? He has something to show you. And then notice what it goes on to say there in verse verse 9. God hath revealed them by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. You see, the deep things of God are found, verses 6 through 8, the redemption of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the testimony of God about Jesus, and those things, those deep things, are being revealed to us, the church, every day. Every day this is happening, especially as we apply ourselves to this right here, to God's word. Because the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and He applies it to our hearts. Just like He did to me when I was a 17-year-old boy lost in my sins on my way to hell. God applied the Word of God by the Spirit of God to my heart and I was born again. And you know what? He still does that very same work now. But because I am progressing more and more. Remember what the catechism told us this morning. You know, more and more to hide to hate and to flee from sin so as i'm progressing these deep things of god are not things that cannot be known no these are things that the spirit of god is dredging up in his great big hydraulic shovel machine of wonder and he's bringing it up to the surface and he's saying hey david here's something that you can have too this is the deep stuff of god and you need this right now it's not hidden and it's not something that we have to you know have some special mystical knowledge for We don't have to have our golden glasses so that we can read a certain text and get it a certain way. No, friend. Let the Spirit of God teach you. That's his work in the church. And with this revelation comes the knowing work of the Spirit of God. Verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why is that? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Friends, the world is never going to like what the Word of God has to say. Never. 
And there is no other revelation besides this revelation. The Holy Spirit's not going to give you something brand new. He's not going to give you something that's never before been seen. It's all right here in the pages of this book. This is his revelation to us. And the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and reveals the deep things of God to us. That's how it works. And it's not the, it's not the wisdom of the world. This is the wisdom that only God gives us. And the Spirit of God is doing that work in the church. Our problem in the church is, you want to know what our problem in the church is? Our problem in the church is we work way too hard to know what the wisdom of the world is. We watch way too much stuff on TV. We listen to way too much stuff on the radio. We, li- we read way too much stuff in our books, our magazines, and our newspapers. That's the wisdom of the world. And we put aside this book of books and allow dust to gather on it. And so when it comes time, when push comes to shove and we need the wisdom of God, we've not allowed the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and apply it to our hearts. Because we're so busy with all of our entertainments. We're so busy with all of our television shows and movies and theater goings and all the rest. We are eating and consuming the wisdom of the world all the time. And we put this aside. The problem with the church today is not the problem that the Spirit of God is not working. No, the Spirit of God is calling us to put down all the entertainments of this worldly mess that we have befriended and to come back to the wisdom of God. Now, that is a great segue. I didn't actually write that in my note, but that's a great segue for the third work of the Spirit of God in our life. First work is... Uh, demonstration of the Spirit and power, that saving work, that Pentecost that happens to every believer when we come to Christ. Man, what wonder. And we look back on that event and we say to ourselves, Whew, that just, it just thrills my soul. Let my soul be thrilled with Jesus every time I think of that. And then the second work is the revelation of the Spirit of God, how he teaches us and guides us and pulls up for us all the deep things of the revelation of God right here in this word. And then the third thing is a separating work of the Spirit of God. Notice that he says there, let's see, what's that, verse 12? Verse 12. We've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, I want you to notice that last phrase there in verse 13. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is the separation. This is the separating work of the Spirit of God. Now, we have the ability because of this Spirit of God in us to understand the difference between the Spirit of the world and the Spirit of God. We have the ability now, because of his revelation work, to understand the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. So we we, now there are two, and we understand there are two. Before, when I was not in Christ, I didn't know there were two. I just thought everything was the wisdom of the world, and I had to pick which wisdom of the world I needed to follow somehow. But now I understand there is a wisdom of the world and there is a wisdom that comes from God because the Spirit of God has revealed that to me. And what he does now is he asks us to separate, to separate the two out and to understand what they are, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, that we might, not in the words of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teaches we might speak, and that we might know the things freely given to us of God. So we're asked to separate, to compare these spiritual things, because there is a spirit of the world. He's already talked about here in this very passage, the prince of the world and the princes of the world, and they have a wisdom. There is a spiritualness to it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a spiritual warfare, and we need to be able to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And this is a separating work that the Spirit of God does because he wants to pull us further and further into this life of God. Next, the Spirit of God makes a difference between the world and the church. Notice verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. 
The things of the Spirit of God are those things that he reveals, the deep things about God, about Jesus Christ, about the Word of God, about the crucifixion, all the great, wonderful things that we can learn about Christ and salvation and things to come and the doctrines of the church, just all of that. He was, he's revealing all of that. And so the Spirit of God makes a difference because we understand that the natural man doesn't get it. And who is the natural man? He's the man that's still in his sin. He's the man that's still spiritually dead. He's like I was as a 17-year-old boy, lost and without hope in the world. And there are plenty of folk all over the world today that need the message of the gospel because they are still natural men and women, living according to the flesh, living according to their own emotions, living according to their own, according to their own soul-driven desires. That's it. The natural man. And he's not receiving the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God's not given him that Pentecost yet. He will. But not yet. Hasn't happened yet. Perhaps it will. And so we look around us and we see that the you know the natural man is not receiving the things of the Spirit of God. Look how they fight against creation today. Look how they fight against holiness today and sexual conduct. Oh my goodness, you can't talk about that. Notice how they fight against you know, the, the, the priority of, of God in life today. They fight against that. They want to do their things their way according to their wisdom. Natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. And so the work of the Spirit of God in the church is to separate us from that. We can't align ourselves with natural men in these things. The natural man retreats from this revelation because they are foolishness to him. And they call us fools for believing it. The natural man cannot understand because he doesn't have the capacity to understand. And Paul tells us here, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They don't have the spirit of God. We do. Which is why we need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified so that they can have the spirit of God. The spirit of God also does another work here, which I I really... I I do you a disservice this morning by making this the last point in my sermon and its conclusion. Because verse 15 could be a sermon series all by itself. Look at verse 15. But he that is spiritual. Now who's he talking about there? He's talking about the church. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's the natural man. But... We have the adversative in verse 15, so we're looking at the other side of the coin now. He that is spiritual, that must be the man who has the Holy Spirit, who's doing the separating work in us, he judges all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. What man is he not judged of? He's not judged of the world. The world's not going to judge the church. No, the world is dead in trespasses and sins. They have not the Spirit of God. Look at verse 16. These two verses together are just so powerful. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Again, he does this comparison. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? He's talking about the natural man. The natural man doesn't know the mind of the Lord. He's not going to tell the Lord what to do. Then he goes to the church. But, this is the other side of the coin, we have the mind of Christ. I don't think that we understand quite yet. Maybe we will when we get to heaven. But we don't quite understand quite yet just how the Spirit of God is working in us as the mind of Christ is being revealed through us and in us. We have the mind of Christ. This is a part of the separating work of the Spirit of God because the mind of Christ is not going to be part of the world's folly. The mind of Christ is not a part of all that. It doesn't act like that. It doesn't feel like that. It doesn't run like that. The mind of Christ, well, look at Philippians chapter 2. You'll find when Paul says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a little picture of the mind of Christ. And how does that come for any believer? It comes by way of the Spirit of God. He implants in us the mind of Christ. He separates us from the, from the wisdom and the spirit of the world. He reveals to us all the deep things of God. And his very first work in us is to call us to himself with the word of God. The spirit of God applying the word of God to the human heart, ladies and gentlemen, is that initial Pentecost. Happy birthday. 
What a gift. And I'm not done. I mean, we're just starting now. We could say, this is way too much. But oh no, we're just scratching the surface here. This is just the first part. There's so much more yet to be seen, especially in First and Second Corinthians. I hope this has spoken to you today. I know it speaks to me. Because there are things that I have not yet separated myself from. There are things that I think... How can I take the mind of Christ and apply it to that thought? How can I take the mind of Christ and do those things? And if you have never yet had that Pentecost experience, where you've had that, aha, I know who I am, I know who he is, I know what I must do, I hope that you'll come to Christ today. I hope today's the day the Spirit of God works that in you. And let us remember to always keep as our theme and sole message Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let us make much of our Savior because that's what the Spirit of God does. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.